Welcome to the special edition of the Construction Record Podcast. This is Vince Versace, National Managing Editor of the Daily Commercial News and Journal of Commerce, joining you today. The Journal of Commerce sent invitations to all three major parties in British Columbia seeking their participation or a response or interest in either holding a town hall, which would be organized by the Journal of Commerce, or one-on-one interviews with their respective leaders. Of those three parties, only one party replied to our request, and that was the BC Liberals. So in this episode, you will hear that one-on-one conversation with Andrew Wilkinson, leader of the BC Liberals. We hope you enjoy it and find it informative. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Vince Versace, National Managing Editor of the Journal of Commerce, Daily Commercial News, and co-host of Canada's award-winning construction industry podcast, The Construction Record. Uh, The Journal of Commerce has been the newspaper record for construction in Western Canada since 1911. As part of our mandate, we see ourselves as a place for the industry to become informed and to use some of that intel to gain some success and better understand the power and politics and trends that impact the industry. So as part of fulfilling this mandate, we've been covering this year's BC election because there've been plenty of issues within it that do impact construction and are of interest to this industry. So today I am pleased to host this one-on-one conversation with Andrew Wilkinson, leader of the BC Liberals. So the industry can hear his perspective on the pressing issues of community benefit agreements, infrastructure investments, and COVID-19 economic recovery. With that, let me allow Andrew to say hello. Well, thanks for having me. Great to be here. And of course, construction is something we talk about and deal with on almost a daily basis in normal circumstances since COVID. We haven't been build, visiting as many sites or as many constructors, but just the other day I was on the Oak Ridge site here, which you may be familiar with. It's a huge conversion of an old shopping mall into a brand new seven tower condominium complex right on the rapid transit line, huge, huge project. And those are the kinds of things we like to see carrying on. And British Columbia has been fortunate that our construction sector has carried on throughout uh, the COVID-19 epidemic. But we just got the employment figures today. And sadly, we see that 15,000 people in the construction sector lost their jobs in September in British Columbia. So a little hard to say where that's going. Uh, It's obviously troublesome and we've got to do what we can to make sure skilled people are kept in work by having the right kind of public infrastructure projects and also all those private sector projects that we want to encourage. Perfect. So that kind of leads us into one of the big issues that those skilled people have been dealing with, skilled trades, people and labor in the industry and owners of projects as well and general contractors. My question to you is you've made a very public stance against community benefit agreements And do you think they impact the COVID-19 economic recovery going forward in BC? You know, my perspective on this is I came out through high school and I didn't have any family connections. My parents weren't those kinds of people who could say, we'll get you a job with our brother-in-law or there's someone down the street who will hire you. I was on my own entirely to find my own kind of work. And, you know, through that period after high school, managed to fumble through and find things to do just by sending in applications. So it's very deeply wired in me that everybody should be treated the same way, that there's no special deal for a certain group of people. You do it on its merits and you earn your way. And in the construction business, of course, we know that there's the whole phenomenon of starting into the field and then getting the appropriate training, the apprenticeships, the uh, skilled engineering roles. There's a whole range of activity in construction. And I like to think that everybody should have access to that on equal basis. And if you're good, you'll get hired for the next project. And it shouldn't be based on whether or not you gave a particular political party a donation a few years ago. That's just wrong. I'm very much in favor of people being able to apply for any job they want and get it on its merits. Interesting. Um, Do you find when you're on the campaign trail, people kind of understand what CBAs are? Well, it's interesting because they've given uh, the CBA idea a funny name. We often call it union benefit agreements because that's where the money goes. 
but the general public are barely aware of this. There's been a saturation advertising campaign in British Columbia for two years now on the radio uh, saying what wonderful thing community benefits agreements are. 90% of the population have got a clue what they're talking about. But people in the sector know exactly what you're talking about. And I was at a, an event in Revelstoke about 18 months ago, and people were talking about the Illicilouette Road Project. And for those listeners and viewers who might not be familiar with British Columbia, when you're driving from the Alberta border at Banff and Lake Louise through British Columbia on Highway 1, you go through the Rogers Pass, which has always been difficult terrain. It's fairly high up and very, very heavy snow loads. And the road has always been a challenge along with the railways. So the railways got through the hard part by tunneling and the roads have been subject to improvements over the years. A particular section of road was bid out at, I think it was about $26 million and ended up costing in the 80s because of community benefit agreements. And the cost per meter, the extra cost per meter of road was $10,000 to deal with the union benefits agreements. So we said, you know, quite graphically, if you take four steps across the stage, you say, look folks, that's four meters. That's four meters of excess road cost that could have been uh, dedicated to getting somebody off drugs. That's how extremely expensive some of these uh, UBAs are. And we think it's inappropriate to have British Columbian taxpayers pay excess prices for projects in order to satisfy the unions because they donated to the NDP in the past. We just think that's fundamentally wrong because the taxpayers are entitled to get the maximum value out of the project and all construction workers should be uh, eligible to work on those projects. Up in Revelstoke, a town of about 5,000 on the west side of the Rogers Pass, the people there are saying, why is it that we're not good enough to work on that project? The answer is you're not one of the NDP's favorite unions, so you're out of luck. So they'll bring in somebody from far away rather than hire the local people. And that's just wrong. So we have said pretty clearly that just like uh, the BC Liberals did in 2001 with a similar arrangement that the NDP had in the 90s, we'll say that any projects going forward will not be subject to union benefits agreements. They'll be subject to the idea that everybody can earn their own way, any builder can bid, and we'll see what happens in terms of the workforce, in terms of how they click together and work together as effective teams. That's the goal and we believe in it. Well, on the topic of that, you mentioned projects. Uh, COVID-19 economic recovery is a big deal for every jurisdiction in Canada, let alone worldwide. But uh, do you believe as part of a COVID-19 economic recovery plan, new infrastructure commitments and investments should be part of that plan? Something like the new, uh, like replacing the Massey Tunnel with a new bridge? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's becoming very clear that this is going to be a very hard winter. If you're in Ontario, Quebec, you know that there's already a progressive kind of shutdown going on. In Europe, it's well underway. British Columbia has been relatively spared, but we're keeping our fingers crossed that we don't get the surge in virus counts. And what that does, of course, is slow down the economy. There are tens of thousands of people unemployed in British Columbia living on the federal payments, and they're not too happy because they're thinking, am I ever going to have a job again in the airline industry? Are hotels going to open again or are they going to shut down forever? Will restaurants ever go back to full capacity? What does my future hold? That's a very legitimate set of questions. And one way to address that is to say, well, it's time to invest in infrastructure. We can keep our skilled construction workforce working through this. Government can borrow money at very, very low interest rates now. This is valuable infrastructure. So if you're not going to build it now, when would you? You've got the available skilled force, you've got access to capital, you've got a demonstrated public need. So on Monday of this week, we were out in Richmond and said, look, it's time to replace the 1958 four-lane Massey Tunnel with an appropriate bridge that was approved before the NDP came in office and canceled the project. You'll be familiar with it. There's six kilometers of preload sand still sitting by the side of the highway. $95 million was sunk into that project and the NDP wrote it off. So our goal is to start that project immediately after taking office so that we can look forward to, first of all, solving the bottleneck that's the biggest traffic bottleneck in Western Canada, secondly, getting people back to work, and third, making life that much easier for people on both sides of the Fraser River because it's a huge traffic corridor and you just have to go there in the afternoon southbound or in the morning yeah. northbound and see the lineups of trucks for 10 kilometers on each side waiting to get through that tunnel. That's ridiculous. Let's deal with the problem. Let's fix it. 
We've got environmental approval for the bridge already. It was already under construction. All the terms have been defied. There'll have to be the rebid process to get it going again, but it's clearly the only way to go because the alternative that the NDP are muttering about is somewhere in the far distant future, putting half a million tons of concrete into the bottom of the Fraser River, one of the most sensitive salmon habitats in the world, and over the objections of the Musqueam and Tawasan First Nations, and they would drag them through the courts for a decade. So the whole thing makes no sense to put this tunnel through. We've got a bridge project that's been approved. It can be operating by probably 2025. Let's get on with it. So with uh, in closing, uh, BC Construction employs roughly 236,000 people, accounts for 9% of the province's GDP. Why is your party's approach and your vision as it concerns labor and construction, the one stakeholders we report to should support? Well, we believe that there's a very skilled construction workforce in British Columbia. They produce great product. We've seen what happens under a BC Liberal government where you get the Portman Bridge, the Golden Ears Bridge, the Kelowna Bridge, the South Fraser Perimeter Road, 14 hospitals, dozens of schools, you name it, we build it. And when we say we're gonna do it, we do it. The alternative is the NDP, who in their 13 years in power out of the last 30, have not built a single hospital, nothing, in spite of having promised the Abbotsford Hospital 12 times. When our, we got into office, we built it in three years. We do stuff, we believe in action, not talk. And as I said earlier, there's no better time to be building heavy infrastructure than right now, because we need the employment, we need the stimulus, government can afford it, and the public want it. So our view is, let's get on with construction on the things that matter. There'll be things like a new hospital in South Surrey. There's the, of course, Massey Tunnel bridge replacement and a whole range of other infrastructure around the province. And when we're getting ready for this election, I basically said to our uh, current MLAs, tell me what would work in your area. A couple of them, like me and the, another individual said, well, I don't really need anything. I want the money to be spent in places where it's needed. That's the kind of thoughtful approach. Others said, you know, I could use a huge amount of infrastructure. And some said very um, reasonable things, like they're in pretty good shape, but they need uh, improved bridge approaches on a bottleneck in their uh, riding. Could they do that? I said, sure, put it on the list, because we want to build BC. In fact, you'll appreciate our campaign slogan this time is <laughs> restore confidence and build BC. I think that probably resonates with your listeners and readers. Yeah, well, it certainly does. And um, the makeup of the industry, in BC is interesting. You know, uh, you have uh, a quarter of it that's unionized, we'll say, and then the rest is open shop. So uh, these issues that you've just been speaking to with us for the last few minutes are important, you know, <laughs> because everybody wants to work, everybody wants to feed their families. But how do you get about executing those projects? And uh, Yeah, and don't get me wrong, yeah. there's a role for unionized construction uh, workers. Mm -hmm. And that's between them and their employer. If the crew wants to unionize, that's their business. What you shouldn't do as a government is say, only our friends who've been donors in the past get the work. You have to, just, there were two Teamsters locals here and one of them was eligible for these CBAs and the other one wasn't. Where's the justice in that? And so it creates this kind of distorted world where you don't do things in their merits, you do them to satisfy your donors historically and that's just wrong. We believe that people who have the skills should be able to compete for the work and we've got a lot of work to do, so let's get going. Sounds good. Any last message for the industry itself? Because you are going to be out there still stumping along until the 24th, so. Uh, Absolutely. Mm. You know, the industry has a very strong track record of quality projects and quality mm. outcomes. Whether it's a major office construction like I was in yesterday with the Lark Group in Surrey, whether it's the Jacob Brothers work I see at the airport, whether it's hospitals, and you know the main players in the hospital construction business, we can do great work, whether it's the local company that does a paving contract or the massive company doing a major project like Sea to Sky. We've got the skills here. Let's deploy them. Let's make use of them and keep people employed because we need this infrastructure. And it's not just because we want to pave things. It's because we want to make it all better. We want to improve what we've got, make it more sophisticated, make it greener, prevent traffic bottlenecks where people are burning fuel for hours. That's in nobody's interest. So we've got a lot of work to do with a growing population and we want the construction industry to be part and parcel of that work. 
Perfect. Well, thank you so much for making time. I know it's a busy schedule you're on with advanced polls coming soon and yeah. eventual election. You have other debates and town halls to participate in. So we, are, I'm sure our listeners and our readers uh, really appreciate you making the time, Andrew, uh, to speak with Always us. Always a pleasure and look forward to talking to you again. Definitely. Thank you so much. Take care. Mm -hmm.